Welcome to another edition of One on One with me, Chris Massis, and with me I have the UN Women Australia Executive Director and former Young Australian of the Year, Julie Mackay. Julie, welcome. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about your role at UN Women Australia. So I've been in my role now for nearly eight years, leading the Australian National Committee for UN Women to raise awareness and raise funds for the work that UN Women does all around the world to right. empower women and girls. It's a really exciting role. We look at women's economic empowerment, we look at ending violence against women, and women's access to leadership opportunities. Mm -hmm. I'm really trying to address some of these issues that have been around forever. That yeah. We just yeah, it must be really rewarding. It is, it is. It's challenging because I think you know, I'm constantly frustrated that we're not making more progress than we are. And particularly in Australia, I think there's a sense that these issues are sort of done. Mm -hmm. Yes, my mother used to talk about gender yeah. inequality. Yeah. But surely that's fixed. So really looking at how do we actually work out what the baseline is, where are we now, and where do we want to be. And you must be very proud of the Young Australian of the Year Award back in 2013. Congratulations. Tell us a little bit about that. I think sometimes these awards are often awarded to the one person that actually leads a fantastic team or a fantastic sector. So I felt a bit uncomfortable with the award itself. But I'm very privileged to work in a sector that I think does really important work representing women and girls. And so it was lovely to have that work. Uh, acknowledged and uh, I think one of the most incredible things about the award was actually meeting the other finalists and having that experience of learning from people who were working in media, in mm. industry, in the corporate sector, but all shared this kind of passion for a better Australia and a better future. So no, well deserved and, and congratulations once again. Um, and as we know, physiotherapists are part of the health, um, health professionals. Um, your advice in your position on what health professionals can do to identify and perhaps act on violence against women? Uh, it's a really good question, Chris. One of the things that we know about violence against women is that there's a level of social stigma or perceived mm. social stigma, which means that women don't often feel comfortable telling friends, family, yeah. what's going on. So quite often it's both um, disclosures to healthcare professionals or healthcare professionals picking up signs yes, yes. that actually starts a process of getting a woman's support. So for your members, mm. one of the big opportunities is to really be, you know, they, they get to know their clients really well, they Absolutely. see what's going on in their lives, they're treating injuries, and to start to actually have that, that dialogue around domestic violence risks, domestic violence incidences, and knowing how to support someone if there is an incidence of domestic violence that, that someone's witnessing. So I think the first step is awareness, yes. knowing that one in three Australians will experience, one in three Australian women will experience violence in her lifetime. Incredible stats, yeah. The other stat that I think is really important to know is that one woman a week dies at the hands of a partner or mm. a former partner. So we're talking about a really big problem and a problem that is in every aspect of our, our world. So for healthcare professionals, I think it's about understanding that that, is, that exists. And if people are presenting with injuries that are unexplained mm. or that come with a level of concern or a lack of sort of want to discuss them or disclose how the injury happened, keeping in mind that there might be a cause to actually ask a woman whether they're okay, yeah. whether they need some support, and then knowing where those support mechanisms can come from. Yeah. So one of the really easy tools is there's a fantastic helpline at the national level called 1-800-RESPECT, yeah. and anyone can call that number for assistance um, regarding domestic violence. So. For healthcare professionals, knowing that number exists, being able to refer it to, to a client is a, is a fantastic first step. Yeah. And I think that's the important thing, the resources there are available um, for healthcare workers to, to use. So. Absolutely. And I mean, your membership as well, Chris, being 70% female, mm. it's possible that within that membership, they've actually got women who've experienced violence. And so even for them, knowing that their colleagues and understand these issues are not judgmental about them and can provide support is really important as well. Yeah, great information. Um, and as you're aware, in 2013, the profession in Australia got behind um, a fundraising campaign and uh, it was, the response was quite incredible and, uh, and our president, Marcus Strips, uh, presented a cheque to UN Women Australia. Tell us a little bit about where that money went, the $10,000 and upcoming campaigns. Fantastic. So can I firstly say thank you to yeah, you and your course, members. Of course. It was an amazing initiative and one of the things that was fantastic about it was not just that you contributed the $10,000 to a program that I'll tell you a bit more about in a second, but also that you inspired a whole lot of other organisations and peak bodies to think about what their role in advancing gender equality was as well. So it was an incredible leadership from the APA. Um, in terms of where that money went, we invested it in our programs in PNG and we understood at the time that the APA wanted to look at women's safety and yes. violence against women. So it was invested in what we call our Safe Cities initiative, 
which is a broad-reaching program that looks at all aspects of women's safety yes. in and around PNG. And so we were looking at things like, how do you prevent sorcery mm. and witchcraft being things that women are accused of wow. and killed for? Mm. In PNG, it's still a really big challenge. Mm. Stats in PNG, two in three women will experience violence, and in the Highlands, 100% of women. So we actually directed the money towards the Highlands programs, looking at marketplaces where women often are working, how do we make them safer, how do we invest in educating police, how do we develop resources for women who are experiencing violence, and how do we start a community conversation about why violence is impacting the community and how it can be stopped. Yeah, and I guess it's important to know uh, these are just uh, programs that start the conversation and then actually need a, a long time to actually get uh, rubber on the road, so to speak. They are. You know, we're not an organisation that can build a well and take a photo of it and show you exactly. the outcome. But I think for me, one of the real sort of strengths of our organisation is that UN Women's been operating in these countries mm -hmm. for many, many years. And in a country like PNG, which has a very sort of challenging development agenda, has a very challenging geography, mm -hmm. has a really challenging history, an organisation that's in there for the long haul can really make change. But I think it's also about recognising that it's laws policies and most importantly attitudinal change mm. and those things do take time. That's right and it's a, it's a collective approach as well. Um, and upcoming campaigns, I, I believe there is a Safe Buses campaign coming up. Yeah, one of the things that a lot of your members will have seen, I think particularly has, that has been in, in our region in India and, and more locally, the number of incidences of mm. violence against women on buses and on public transport mm. is really something that I think the Australian community has become more aware of. It's not necessarily a new issue. But we are finding that in PNG it's a major barrier for women to get to work wow. and children to get to school. Sure. Because women are simply saying, I'm not putting my child on a bus where I know they're likely to get sexually assaulted mm. or attacked. And for themselves, it's a very high price to pay mm. to go to the marketplace or to go to work if you know that you've got a very high risk of violence. So you and women's programs are absolutely long term trying to do that attitudinal change piece. But I guess the Safe Buses program that we're prioritising this year is about saying, well, in the short term, mm. we've got to keep these women employed because we know that employment leads to better educational outcomes for children. We know that employment means that women are more likely to be able to get out of domestic violence situations. So how do we keep women employed? How yeah. do we keep kids at school? Yeah. We get them on buses. Yeah, and just a just little thing around transport yeah. makes a, such a big difference in all those other um, access issues. So. Absolutely. For me, I, I come back to the story that I think inspired ADA in 2013. It was the trigger, yeah. The, the young Indian woman, and she was 23 and on mm. her way to or her home. I think I was 23 when I took on this job, yeah. and it never occurred to me that something would happen to me on public transport mm. to and from work, mm. you know, to and from my nightlife, or whatever else was going on. And I think for all Australians, it's that moment of thinking, no matter what's happening for us, we don't fear for our lives when we get up in the morning and go to work, for most of us. Mm. And so a donation of five, ten, a hundred, five thousand dollars, whatever you can actually mm. provide, can change lives Absolutely. in a country like yeah, And I think that's a great, uh, a great message to send to our members. Um, and, a, and a global program around Beijing, my understanding is there is a, a, a Beijing Plus 20 uh, is a technical name, but a little bit about that. So this year is the 20th anniversary of the Beijing conference, which was when Hillary Clinton gave her famous speech, Women's Rights are Human Rights. And essentially at that conference, all member states of the UN signed up to a blueprint for gender equality. Yeah. 12 areas where we all committed that we would take action. Things like ensuring women had access to employment with this supported services mm. that are necessary around childcare, around um, flexibility, male leaders for gender equality, mm. looking at laws and policies. And 20 years on, there has been some progress, yeah. but it's yeah. been really slow. Yeah, sure. And so the UN's really taking stock this year to say, what is it that we need to do? The blueprint's still right. Mm. We know what we need to do. We've known it for 20 years. Yep. What's it going to take to actually get member states to do it? Mm. And that's Australia. But it's also Australia playing a role in our region where there isn't necessarily the funding and the capacity um, to, to leverage these services. So from our perspective, it'll be about raising awareness about what that blueprint actually afforded to us. Basic rights of education, healthcare, freedom of speech. Um, but also, from the Australian perspective, how do we resource the countries in our region that really need our support? Great. I think it's important to, to reflect and look back, but if the blueprint's still right, I think to reinforce and, and start the journey again. Absolutely. And, and just finally, just a, a general closing message from you as the ED of um, UN Women Australia to, to all Australians, what would you say um, leading into 2015 and beyond? 
I think I'd firstly say thank you for your support and for being open to understanding how challenging the issues of gender equality are. The 8th of March is International Women's Day and we hope that your members and that the community will really get behind us in raising awareness about the fact we don't want it to be another 20 mm. years mm. before we've achieved gender Absolutely. equality. We want this to be something that's achieved in my lifetime, in your lifetime. Um, but also our neighbours in PNG, mm. in the Pacific, really need our support. And a contribution, big or small, can make a huge difference. So we hope everyone gets behind the campaign and we look forward to seeing everyone out in March. Great, look, thank you. And on that note, I'd like to thank you for the great work that you do, your organisation does, and your, um, your team, your staff members, but also your volunteers, um, and doing some great things. So good luck with your endeavours, and uh, the APA will be here to, and physiotherapy will be here to support you. So thanks for joining us. Thanks. And, um, and good luck in 2015. Thank you.